Hi, y'all. Bit of an interesting week in American politics, huh? We had the, the Mueller hearings, or as I like to call them, the Sergeant Sundowner hearings. We'll talk about that a little bit later in a different video. And we've had the Democrat debates uh, night one and night two. Night two is tonight. Uh, I've watched bits and pieces of it. It's just a lot of uh, recapitulating much of what we heard last night and, and a lot of the same talking points that you hear from the media or in the, on the media a lot. So not really a lot new, that's new there. There's some personality conflicts, which are interesting and they're fun to point you know, point fingers and laugh, but uh, I want to talk about some of the substance as opposed to just picking on the stupid people. Now, one thing that I thought was really, really excellent that CNN started off with and didn't abide by was the penalty that would be imposed upon someone who interrupted an opponent, that they would have time deducted from their time. Uh, I didn't actually see any deductions happening, so maybe someone with a stopwatch will have noticed it. I didn't actually time it, but it didn't seem like to me that it really amounted to much. Uh, I like that idea. I've also mentioned that uh, even though it gets repetitious on one stage, uh, and I, you know, you hear the same point put out time and again, if you watch a lot of the news and if you listen to a lot of the candidates, that will not be particularly interesting for you. But a lot of people watch these debates because they want the issues presented to them by that person without the interruption of the media or the filter of another candidate saying something about what the person said. Like I uh, often say when a politician is asked a question and they start talking about, well, my opponent's position is this. I wish someone would chime in and say, look, 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 I'm giving you the opportunity to lie to me about what you pretend to believe. Don't lie to me about what they pretend to believe. I will let them lie to me about what they pretend to believe later. Right now, I want to listen to your lies. Because, you know, they're politicians and they all kind of lie. But anyway, uh, I, I like the idea that each candidate on the stage has to respond to the same question as opposed to the idea of candidate one, two, and three will give you this question and you know, we get bored of it by candidate, you know, four, probably candidate three, but definitely by candidate four. We go, hey, candidate four, uh, can you say something shitty about what candidates one, two, or three just said? Thanks, because we, we need the entertainment. Um, that's, if you look at the headlines, they're not much on substance. You'll hear things like, so-and-so slammed by so-and-so for thus and such, or, uh, you know, uh, there's been an, uh, an outrage or a backlash about this misspoken thing, or tonight, you know, it's uh, the way Joe Biden greeted uh, Senator Harris. Interesting things, good for entertainment, not uh, not meant to educate the American people, not meant to bring uh, any kind of knowledge to people. It is just uh, you know, high school uh, stuff, which can be entertaining, and that's what the news does. They do infotainment. A few near facts and a little bit of en entertainment. So anyway... Uh, last night and tonight, there are three issues, uh, border, the border issue, I'll just call it border security, uh, border policy, immigration policy, I guess would be a better way to put it, uh, some, a little bit on firearms and health care. And you get uh, some of the front riders, like uh, some of the bigger names, Warren and Sanders, Sundowner Sanders, uh, who, you know, they want to decriminalize the border, which, to be fair, does not mean making it legal to come in. It just means removing criminal penalties and, and keeping only the civil penalties. The problem with civil penalties is it presupposes that the people have something that can be, you know, that a judgment can be laid against, you know, finances of some type. Uh, people come across the border not known for having a lot of money, uh, particularly when most of them are economic uh, migrants. They're not refugees. They're not asylees. They're not fleeing persecution. They want to come here to have a better life, which you know, I don't begrudge people wanting to come here to have a better life though I do begrudge them breaking our law to do it. And you hear a uh, story, you hear things like uh, a, it's always a woman and, and, and her, her poor daughter, uh, you know, that's the example, and they get to the border and, you know, she's had to go miles and miles through all these various countries to get here and that's not, she's not a criminal. I'm like, look, the, the woman has walked her child thousands of miles through several different countries just to, have, just to have the opportunity to show up here and violate our laws. Yes, she's a criminal. She's not the worst of criminals, but that is, she is a criminal. She is a lawbreaker. Uh, uh, by the way, I get this uh, objection sometimes. I'm not saying that any particular person by name, I'm not saying this person committed a crime. I'm talking about the category of people who do this, which presupposes that there exists some people who will do the action, which could be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and they would be guilty. It's not the, the presumption of innocence doesn't apply to abstract people. It, it applies to particular persons accused of particular wrongful conduct. I've had that debate. I often get a, the, the benefit of attracting the smartest leftist you can possibly find. Uh, they track me down on Twitter to show off how smart they are. Like when I was talking about the Mueller hearing, this, uh, this woman, uh, obviously a genius, told me that she knew that I was lying because she'd read the report, the Mueller report, and she watched, of the seven hours, 
a little over seven hours of the Mueller hearings. She watched all five of them. So how could how could she possibly be wrong? And then I responded, did you watch all, did you read all 320-ish pages of the Mueller report too? Because you know that's about the same percentage. Uh, anyway, the uh, the Mueller report, by the way, just not to give anything away, a complete like that went over like a fart in church. It was so terrible. Very interesting. But we'll get on. To, we'll talk about that in a different video. So anyway, um, I, I hear things like uh, Pete, uh, Mayor Pete, is one of the smarter people. He's well educated. Uh, you know, uh, went to Oxford, I think it was Oxford. Really smart guy uh, on paper. Says a lot of profoundly stupid things. And uh, of course, CNN, MSNBC, these other news organizations will rush to try to fact check these people to give them uh, some credibility for their statements. But for example, Mayor Pete said something like. 90% of Republicans support universal background checks. CNN's fact checkers said that this is true according to one poll, uh, the Quinnipiac, however you pronounce it, university poll. Uh, I've looked at it. Um, they said it's the same, uh, roughly the same result that they got in a previous poll on the same subject. And this is an issue where it matters very much how you phrase the question, what kind of answer you're going to get. If you look at the difference between the way Quinnipiac does it and Gallup does it, Gallup uses the very unfair, strategically useful tactic of uh, having the follow-up question. Instead of, okay, I've talked about this before, but uh, when, you, when you hear these uh, rape statistics from studies about the prevalence of rape, one of the things that the researchers will do is they'll ask a series of questions, and then they will decide for themselves what constitutes a violation for the person. They, they will deny the person the right to agree or disagree with whether or not the uh, conduct they engaged in is what they would consider to be a sexual violation. So apparently the researchers are really big on giving people their agency and the right to consent or refuse consent, except for when it comes to answering their questions, in which case you have no agency and we'll decide for you and you'll you'll like it. You're asking for it, Missy, you shouldn't have taken the survey if you didn't want it. They do that a lot with gun policy. It's not true that 90% of Republicans, well, let me rephrase this, it's true that if you ask the question, do you believe in background checks? for gun purchasers, you'll get one answer. That's what the uh, Quinnipiac, this is not Quinnipiac's fault, by the way, this is CNN's recharacterization. CNN's fault for characterizing falsely what the, uh, the questionnaire actually asked. It asked, do you think there should be background checks for gun purchasers? CNN pretends that's what universal background checks means. That's not what a universal background check is. So if you say universal background check, and you don't have a definition for it. Everyone gets to use their own definition, so they will, you will get a whole bunch of people who agree with the proposition there should exist universal background checks. But once you lay a definition on what that entails, the, disagree the agreement ends right then and right there. Uh, Gallup asks this, and they ask it in a couple different ways, one of which is, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the state of gun laws in the United States, the, the general uh, national gun policy and the policy in your state, things like that? And you get two answers. Well, you get three. I don't know. Yes, I'm satisfied. And no, I'm dissatisfied. The CNN type of people will believe, will take a, I am dissatisfied with the state of the law to mean that I therefore want to make stricter inroads uh, on gun control. That is not what I disagree, I'm dissatisfied means. And in fact, uh, Gallup knows that it's possible to not be satisfied with it and want to you know, reduce restrictions. So they ask the follow-up question. Okay, for those of you who are dissatisfied, uh, do you want stricter uh, less strict or no change. And a small percentage of people say, I'm dissatisfied, but I don't want any change. Those are the types of people who uh, kind of realize the, that the Bill of Rights is kind of a package. You know, I, it, I don't like that this is the way that it is, but I also understand that there are things in here that I like that people of different, different political persuasions don't like. And the moment that I attack their rights and say those aren't worth protecting is the exact same moment that they're going to turn around and return the courtesy. And I don't want to go down that road, so I don't like it, but let a sleeping dog lie. I can deal with it. Move on. So you have that group, small, about 5%, something like that. Then you have people who are dissatisfied, who don't like how restrictive the gun laws are. That's about twice as many. And the long and the short of it is, is once you start breaking this down out of just the some generic uh, statement that has no definitional content to it, no constraint on it, where you can get agreement by artific you know, by, by pretending that everyone thinks that it means the same thing. The moment you start laying conditions on it, the, uh, the agreement evaporates, and that's why you don't get anything done in the Congress. It is not the boogeyman of the NRA, it's the American people themselves. It's, as it turns out, they don't actually vote on slogans. 
they vote, uh, in, at least in sufficiently large numbers, they vote on actual issues, not just bumper sticker slogans with uh, catchphrases. But anyway, so once you start breaking that out, what you find out is that more than half the country supports either keeping the laws the way they are now or making them less restrictive, and a minority of the country uh, uh, wants to make them more strict. So that's why you get the issue, get the situation in Congress you have. It's not actually the NRA. Uh, and there are a lot of people like me who are for, all for gun rights and who despise the NRA. I think uh, the worst thing the NRA ever did as far as putting out its message is, well, the first hundred years of its existence, that doesn't help it any because it wrote most of the most encroaching gun laws that we have at the federal level because it, it wrote them in the states and then says, hey, look, this worked really well in New York. Let's just uh, get this incorporated into federal law. And that was its first century of operation. It wasn't until the 1970s. When they, uh, when they discovered the first provision in the first statutory scheme set out with which they did not completely agree, and then all hell broke loose. And then suddenly, they're a, they're, you're a, you're a right-wing extremist organization because you disagreed with subpart C of paragraph 27 in the 50, you know, on the 55th page of this, of this law. You terrorists! And that's where the, 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 uh, the spin started. So anyway, uh, but then they hired someone like Wayne LaPierre, who says a lot of really stupid things. Uh, they're good slogans if all you want to do is not think and just have something to say, like, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Which true, that's a good guy with a gun is a way to stop a bad guy with a gun. It is not the universe of ways, and you don't accomplish anything by telling people lies. Except for, you, you know, when a, when a person says that, the per anyone of thought should look at it and go, well, actually, that's not true. Uh, you should not listen to that guy. He should not be your spokesman. And that's why he's not my spokesman. He's an idiot. Wayne LaPierre should shut up and go away. <clears throat> but whatever, the NRA wants him, so they're stuck with him. I'm never going to be a member of that organization, uh, not least of which because I despise it for its past. So anyway, there, there's that. <clears throat> it's just absolutely false that this is the case. Uh, another thing that a lot of the organ uh, by the way, the, the Quinnipiac people, uh, they talk about how good their polls are in relation to the number of media uh, organizations in the various countries that cite to them. They'll say, we're recognized by media and government in 41 countries. I'm like, ooh, a tiny minority of countries have media organizations and government officials who cite to you. The overwhelming majority of media organizations in the world don't, and the overwhelming majority of government officials in the world don't. Hmm, interesting. It says absolutely nothing about how good your polls are, and I will remind you that these polls that, these pollsters who's Credibility depends upon the fact that uh, government officials cite us, news organizations cite us, um, and we're, we're good at our job. They're wrong most of the time. Uh, th these are the same people who believe that it was 95% certain that Donald Trump could never be president. And then, you know, you, you see them get on, on the, the news outlets and they'll say things like, well, I believe in data, and this time data failed me. No, data didn't fail you. It's just that you have had for years a model that does not work and you finally have run up against uh, the inflection point of that, where you realize what we're doing doesn't work. And now the margins are such that our lies can no longer uh, obtain because they're so out of step with what's happening, they just don't work anymore. So you have that kind of issue. It happens in statistics a lot. It's very easy to confuse yourself. Uh, when you're doing empirical studies. Uh, Feynman said, said the first test for any scientist, and so too with any statistician, any mathematician or logician for that matter, the first rule of it is don't fool yourself. And remember, you are the easiest person for you to fool. And a lot of people don't take that on board. It is really, really difficult, as anyone who's a, a competent scientist will tell you, to properly state the question that you want, properly state the issue that you want to resolve. Uh, it took centuries for us to finally get to getting good at picking questions by eliminating things that were stupid questions before we started asking ourselves appropriate questions that were intelligently informed before they were asked so that way we could actually endeavor to study them. Uh, if you take a statistics class and you start doing hypothesis testing, you will figure out that choosing your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis is actually not as easy as it sounds. You have to be very precise in what it is you want to study because you have got to figure out that for all of the clever tricks that can be used validly, uh, this really only tests for one thing, and one thing only, and that is randomness versus non-randomness. And so if you don't structure your question within the context of being able to distinguish intentional action or non-random outcomes versus random outcomes, you are wasting your time, which is what all these studies about um, 
the alleged uh, disproportionate representation of people, of various minorities in government agencies, political organizations, the prisons, whatever it happens to be, they're all bullshit because they, uh, they, at bottom, can only answer one thing, and that is to say that the state of affairs that we see, namely the number of whites in prison versus the number of blacks in prison, the number of women in, in office, the number of women not in office, the number of gays in office or black people in office or Asians in office, whatever happens to be, that the outcome that we see, we did not get by chance, which is the most blatantly obvious thing you could ever say about elected bodies. Of course it's not by chance. It is a non-random process by design. This is not ancient Athens. This isn't the bully. We don't use sortition. Uh, it is All you've managed to say is, our elections aren't done randomly. Yes, that's exactly what a voting process about uh, a candidate selection is. So too with incarceration rates. We don't randomly imprison people. We imprison people based on being able to prove whether or not they have done a particular act or failed to do some required act, the doing of which or the failure to comply with which is a violation of a criminal statute that has a jail penalty associated with it. It is not random. We don't just say, all right, open up the phone book and this week we're going to convict, oh, page 32, whoever you people are, sorry, you got to go to prison for, oh, uh, we have a uh, kid fiddling, rape, and oh, genocide. <laughs> it's not your week. This is going to be a really bad week for, you know, page 38. That's not how we do criminal justice. It's not how we elect people. It is, I hope, not how people are are appointed to boards uh, and promoted through companies. Though there is the uh, interesting area of study in business management or in decision making is what or what called or what is what are called anti patterns, which are the same non patterns. They're patterns of non reasoning that that uh, repeat themselves. One of them is called the Peter Principle, which is that people are promoted right to their level of incompetence, where they then remain for the remainder of their career instead of being put back down to where they were competent. Yeah, they get, oh, you're completely incompetent, we'll just keep you here, instead of putting you back down where you were productive. But anyway, this, this is, it happens. So you have that. Um, you have, uh, as I mentioned, the, the calls to decriminalize the border uh, issue, which sounds suspiciously like open borders. But of course, when one of the moderators will point that out, uh, or one of the infotainers will point that out, the candidate will, will say something along the lines of, you're using Republican talking points. Well, I'm not a Republican. And I'm not a conservative. Uh, let me qualify that. If, you're, if the issue is about the interpretation of legal texts, that is to say the job of a judge, I'm, ju I'm just as Scalia conservative. I'm just as Thomas conservative. Because I think that the language on the page actually matters. And that when legislatures or uh, constitutional conventions or whatever they happen, whatever the level of government is we're talking about where they create a document, I think that the words they choose have a purpose to be there. They have a meaning. Uh, they include certain things and they exclude certain other things, and things that they did not mean to put into it are not valid exercises of a judicial authority. Because every time you make a constitutional decision that says, the due process clause requires that we do this, you have effectively said this is no longer a valid topic for debate. The we, five, maybe nine, but at a minimum, five, uh, five lawyers on the Supreme Court have decided that this is not a valid topic for the American people to discuss. You may no longer discuss whether, whether uh, in any binding way, I mean, you, can, you can get drunk at the bar and talk about it, whether or not gay marriage should or shouldn't be allowed, whether or not abortion should or shouldn't be allowed, whether or not there should or shouldn't be assisted suicide, whether or not there should or shouldn't be capital punishment for juveniles. Whatever your decision is on any of those issues, one thing is exceedingly obvious. Not a, one of them is mentioned anywhere in the Constitution, and not a single person who casted a vote to ratify the Constitution, and for centuries thereafter thought that it addressed any of those subjects, because it didn't. And if you want to know what subjects are that were addressed, all you have to do is look at the work that the, the people who ratified it thought they were doing. It's not like they, they kept it a secret. They wrote extensively about it. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, so on legal interpretation, I'm quite conservative, uh, judicially conservative. On policy issues, not necessarily so. And on economic issues, not necessarily so. Then it's a, it, it's a well, I, I don't have like this one overarching political philosophy it's just that I, you know, I take propositions and I see what they entail, and then I compare what they entail against what other things that it entail, and what are the, the costs and benefits. It's, it's real politics, essentially. You know, what are the, what are the practical considerations for this when you're addressing a policy that would be legal to enact? So long as the question put to me is not, what do you think about a law which rushes up against an individual person's liberties? Then I have a lot more time and a lot more uh, space to talk about that issue. 
But once you say, I want to engage in an action which touches upon a traditional liberty of the American people, I have no time for you. Conversation is done. Uh, and I'm a bit like Ben Franklin on this, the speech that he tried but couldn't give to the convention urging the, urging the adoption of the Constitution <clears throat> was, he'd have somebody else read it because he was too weak, he was too feeble to stand and speak. And it was, uh, look, this is an imperfect document. Uh, I think that it has many errors, and if they be such, I will take them to my grave. Because if every one of us uh, went back to our, our hometowns to talk to the people and expressed all of our reservations about it, it would never get ratified. But whatever the problems with it are, they can be sorted out by a good and just people, which the American people are. It is a document which will perdure for an age, up until, and less and until, the American people have reduced themselves to such a state that they, again, require a despot to be their master. And so he said, I'm going to take my objections to this document to my grave. I will keep them to myself. It is politically useful to look like we're unanimous. And it is actually true that we are largely unanimous. No other committee of people is going to build a better document than this. It's the best we can do, imperfect though it is. And he also mentioned that uh, I, um, I I have lived long enough to, to doubt my own infallibility. I've lived long enough to have time for what other people have to tell me because I no longer trust myself. I'm no longer young enough to know everything, essentially. And uh, I would hope that this wisdom would, would chop itself around the convention and uh, we will do this just... And, and it worked out. Uh, there, are, there are, of course, problems with the Constitution. It's been amended 26 times. Uh, you know, people thought, looked about it and said, uh, uh, something needs to be fixed. And not all of our fixes have been smart, like uh, moving the Senate away from being you know, representative of the legislatures to just another uh, publicly elected body. That has created problems. And if there were one error in American politics I could change, it would be that. Because the great bulwark that stood against the encroachment against the rights of the states was uh, the fact that the Senate represented the state's interests in the federal in the federal government. Uh, now it represents the population's interests. It's a different electorate than the representatives in the House are within a state, but it's still the citizens of that state, as opposed to the legislature, the state government itself. And uh, it should not therefore be surprising you've had a lot of encroachments against the, uh, the states, a lot of unfunded mandates, and a lot of uh, you must make your drinking age 21 or else we're going to slash your funding, that kind of thing. So you, it creates a lot of problems, but it is what it is. Uh, so long as you're not confronting me with that kind of question, which every gun control policy you propose will brush right up against what the Second Amendment clearly says and uh, was clearly understood to mean when it was ratified, uh, when it was proposed, when it was argued for and argued against during you know, the time of the ratification, during the constitutional period, and for uh, two centuries thereafter. Uh, it wasn't until you know recently someone, hey, you know what? This Constitution thing doesn't mean whatever I thought it meant for the last 200 years. It's completely new. And then you had a few justices who have said, oh yeah, that sounds good to us, because you have some justices, unfortunately, who are primarily concerned about uh, getting the right answer, where the right answer is something that, does not, that is not constrained by what the law demands. Uh, Justice Scalia, for all my dad thinks I'm nuts, for like my dad hates Justice Scalia, he's never read an opinion the man has written, like most people who hate him, he only knows what about Justice Scalia, what you hear in the media, which is, if you listen to the media representation of Justice Scalia, and you actually listen to anything Justice Scalia has ever said or written, they don't, they don't jive. They're completely unrelated. Uh, but that's what the, the media does. It, he is, uh, he has said it himself, and I agree with this completely, he is the pinup, he is like the, the centerfold for uh, criminal, criminals throughout the country. He is one of the justices who has been the most vociferous in protecting the rights of a criminal defendant. Uh, he has written very sharp dissents in a number of cases, one of which is called Maryland against Craig, which this goes up against the, the right to confront your witnesses, confront the witnesses against you, the, the, your accuser in court, in open court in front of the jury or the judge if you've decided to have a bench trial. The state of Maryland says, actually, no, that's not a constitutional right. Uh, it's a constitutional suggestion, and we generally follow up with their cases where we've decided that the defendant does not have the right to confront his accuser or to be confronted with his accuser in court. In fact, uh, we, will, we will just put a, a picture, uh, a video monitor of the witness uh, and a prosecutor in the room asking them questions. Defense, you can't be there, so if the, if the witness is being coached, 
no one will see it except for the prosecutor, and uh, and that'll be good enough. The Supreme Court, um, five lawyers, uh, agreed, and uh, Scalia wrote a dissent, a very powerful, actually, the whole court, I think the whole court agreed, and Scalia wrote a very powerful dissent, and he says it, you know, because they're talking about the virtual, it's a virtual trial, uh, a virtual confrontation. He goes through and he, he puts in there a blurb at one point. And I am entirely convinced that this this law is virtually constitutional. However, because not because it's not actually constitutional, I would vote to strike it down. It, great, uh, you know the only justice up there who thinks that the right you know it seems to say you have the right to be confronted with the witnesses against you, you know, and that is always for thousand you know back in the mists of history has meant that the witness or the accuser whoever it is appears in court on the stand under oath in front of the trier of fact and answers to your face the questions that you have or that your counsel has. There have always been powers of judges, uh, magistrates, whatever you want to call them, to punish defendants for uh, improper conduct in court if they threaten a witness. A, a person in court in front of the judge can do things where the judge can curtail uh, you know, whatever needs to be curtailed to make sure that the trial goes on. The, the defendant does not have the right to stop the trial by acting like an asshole. And if that means the person's mouth is taped and they're strapped down, you know, shackled to the, the, the chair so they can't get up and they can't swear at the people and scream over it and whatever, then so be it. The jury's going to see you acting like an asshole. So, you know, best of luck to pull on that and see that. Best of luck. You try that out and see how it goes. Uh, so judges have, have always had that power, but that wasn't an issue here. It was just that the state decided for no particular reason other than the witness who happened to be a child might have been scared to testify in front of the person. Well, you know, I'm... I don't see any, unless the witness is, is put off by testifying uh, provision in the Constitution, it says, it, you know, it seems to say, in all criminal prosecutions, and this is a criminal, anyway, you get the point. So, uh, like most people who don't like Scalia, they haven't read him, and like most people I, come, I get confronted with, they, they care so passionately about the subject, they can't actually be bothered to learn anything about it. Like the woman who watched all five hours of a seven-hour hearing. I'm like, well, good job. He actually had two hearings that day, lady, but whatever. And, you know, I don't just look at this as an American, like, oh, my little provincial area of the world. I watch uh, parliamentary hearings in Canada, the United Kingdom, to include its, uh, you know, the, the four uh, countries that make it up, well, the three countries in the principality that make it up. Uh, I watch some, um, I watch in New Zealand, I watch in Australia, I watch uh, in the EU, various countries in, in Europe. I even watch some in Africa. Uh, you know, if it speaks English and, and I, I will tune in from time to time, which is why I know about you know the Maori Party in New Zealand when Donald Trump was elected, Marama Fox got up in in their parliament to join in on all the Trump is a racist, he's a bigot, a xenophobe, a hum, you know the whole thing that you hear from everyone here on the left all the time, and yeah, by the way, most of the right you heard all the time too, and uh, and then after going through all the perfunctory, what a terrible evil demon he is. She then had to sing his praises because he was killing TPP, which the Maori party opposed because it would it would exploit Maori people, among other things. And she has to go through and say, and I grew them here, and I grew them there. And, and although he was wrong in the way he did it, he recognized there was an upsurge, an, a distaste for, a distrust of, a dislike of the status quo. And you mark my words, New Zealand, he's lecturing the other parties. Uh, this is a party that had two seats for 13 years, and now they have no seats uh, shortly after this. Uh, anyway, she goes on and on and on, lecturing them about how, and that same wave that struck America is going to come through New Zealand, because we have the same dissatisfaction here, the disaffected here, and we're going to rise up, and we're going to wipe away, you know, essentially do away the right wing. Well, that didn't quite happen. Um, the Maori party was wiped out, has no more seats in parliament. Uh, there was a, a, a change in the political climate, but uh, the it was not what people thought it would be, in the same way that it wasn't what people thought it would be here. So, like a lot of people who want to pontificate, she identified that there was an issue between uh, Trump's election and the disaffection of much of the electorate, completely misread what the disaffection actually is. They, they always seem to think that whatever the disaffection is, they believe their own press. The, dif the disaffection is caused by the party we don't like. It's never us. And it's, like, no, it's just not true. By the way, Ben Franklin's speech to the convention also said that about uh, a man, just like his sect or religion, tends to think himself infallible when he's young. This is a, a problem. Groupthink is a problem. And one of my big complaints about the, the Democrat Party right now is that it's behaving so idiotically, it is going to relegate itself into nothingness, which is unfortunate because it would not be wise to have a one-party system uh, where one party is, is heavily dominant. You need another body, another party, 
or another faction of some type that has sufficient numbers to be able to delay bad decisions. The problem with the Democrats is, is that everything a Republican says is a bad decision. Now, on health care, they, uh, they, they identify problems, but they never manage to identify solutions. They point to all these different countries, and they hope that you, the American voter, actually know nothing about these countries because they presume that most of you uh, are not like me and that you don't pay attention to the parliamentary procedures uh, and hearings in other countries. You don't, play, you don't pay attention to the legislation. You don't pay attention to their financial issues. You don't pay attention to their politics and their problems. Guess what? Uh, this uh, Look at the UK. It's frequently cited to. Recently, Theresa May said it was voted the best or it was recognized by some intergovernmental organization or non-governmental organization as being the best in Europe. I don't think that's true, but whatever. Uh, it is not. Um, you cannot have everything that you want in a healthcare system. And the same way, you cannot have an economy that works for everyone. You can have an economy that works for the majority of people, but not one that works for everyone. It's just not possible. But anyway, um, the you you have to whatever you decide to focus on here is going to come at uh, is going to come with a cost to something else here, and this is the the shell game, the the three card Monty of politics. So in the UK, uh, they ration drugs. You are not permitted in the United Kingdom on their system to have certain medications, not because they're not effective, not because they're dangerous, but because they're expensive, and the government doesn't want to pay. It pays a hundred uh, just up. Uh, it's it's uh, yearly contribution, and with the latest round of increases, it's supposed to cap out at 134 billion per year, which the Guardian mentioned is 500 pounds per uh, person in the country. Now that was for NS NHS England. When they say in the country, they don't mean the country of England. They mean the United Kingdom. Uh, so they're talking about Scotland, Wales, and, uh, and Ireland. So. They're, they're trying to smuggle in a whole bunch of extra people who aren't accounted for in that price to put the price to be lower per person than what it is. It's actually uh, about 2,500 pounds or 2,400 pounds per uh, English person. Uh, wait, that's not true. It's 1,600 pounds per, per uh, person in England. But for the people who pay the, the taxes who actually pay for it, it's about 2,500 pounds. It's about 3,000 dollars uh, and if, oh shit, I ran the numbers earlier if you convert it to American dollars and you scale it up it's about five thousand per person five thousand dollars per person per year to be told you may not have this drug you may not have that drug I'm sorry you can't have that cancer surgery this year you have to wait they have uh, several million people on surgical wait lists a significant proportion of them have been waiting for more than a year many of them die waiting kind of like the outrage here with the veterans uh, one of the groups that they tend to cancel surgeries for the most is one that is least able to represent its interests, namely children. They cancel 20,000 surgeries uh, for children per year, including can life-saving cancer surgeries, uh, uh, orthopedic surgeries that you need to have. Uh, so if you have like a broken growth plate, it needs to be repaired so that way you had to have your leg lengthened. Sorry, your other leg will just grow. We'll get to you next year. And if you have to walk with a limp, no big deal. It's all on the NHS, though. And in virtually every PMQ, uh, many of the ministers' questions, the NHS is a central topic of controversy, that it is not being funded sufficiently well. They pay $134 billion per year, just in England, not counting Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, and it's still not enough. Now, mind you, if you scale it back when it first started, it had a budget of $9 billion, and it was the eye of the world, and it is now scaled up to $134 billion. Uh, if you look at in the United States, it's of course true that we have problems. Every system does. You have to pick something that is going to give way in light of other priorities. Every country has to do it. In the United Kingdom, however, it's not simply that, that we won't give you this drug. It's you can't go somewhere else and get it either. So uh, Canadians, by the tens of thousands, come to the United States for medical care because uh, we have better medical care than they have in Canada, although it's not uh, free healthcare and it's not universal, which means that someone has to pay for it somewhere. There's no such thing as free healthcare. But anyway, um, they come here. Uh, a lot of British people will come here for various surgeries, but when children have life-threatening illnesses, uh, you may have heard this case, I think it was two years ago, maybe a year and a half, something like that, the, the, the government-run medical care, the doctors decided, and because, you know, they're paid by the government, they're government actors, so the United Kingdom government decided that this, this boy simply should just die rather than being permitted to travel to the United States for surgery. And so they required the boy to die. 
Uh, the judges enforced, yeah, no, you can't go to the United States and get this surgery. It's not signed off on, on our formulary or our list of services. You're not entitled to it. Just die, kid. And he died. That's what. That's one of the problems with government-mandated health care. When I say government-mandated, I don't mean it's like mandated that you shall just have it and, you know, that's the extent of our involvement. The government looks over your finances of the various hospitals and health agencies. They decide what services you can and cannot provide, what drugs you may and may not give, based not on patient need, but based on tax burden. You know, how, how much more tax can we, can we extract out of people? Now, uh, I'm going to end on this point because it's one that the Democrats, the, the progressive wing of the Democrats, who seem to be, I don't want to say they seem to be leading it, but they're certainly the most prominent people. I don't know whether that's just because they're the biggest eyesore and they're the squeaky wheel. I don't know whether they're the new center of the party. Uh, I don't really know how that's going to shake out. But, uh, you know, Sanders, Warren, Harris, uh, a few, uh, Booker, they, they have all variations. Of, you know, Warren wants to make, uh, Warren and Sanders want to make uh, it illegal for you to have private health insurance because reasons. And they go through all this. And uh, you will hear time and again from various senators talking about... Uh, it, that, Warren was not answering a question last night, but many of the other ones, many of the other candidates do this too. When asked about, will you have to raise taxes to pay for this thing that you have proposed in the health care? And Warren, uh, among others, always dodged that question, saying the overall amount that you pay out will be less than it is now, and that should be good enough for you, citizen. the The problem with that is these people fundamentally do not understand the American way, uh, which is sad because you know Warren's educated. Uh, Harvard educated, uh, taught at Harvard at least. She's a smart, smart woman. She, I mean, she has to know this history. She just decided that uh, I'm not going to learn from it. And it, the, I saw this on Twitter. Uh, a lot of people saying, yes, it's true. If the overall cost is lower, it doesn't matter if your tax goes up so long as that's offset somewhere else by a reduction. It, this is complete gibberish. It does matter. And a couple of the Democrats have noticed, and they say, look, it's important that Americans have choice. It is one of the things that about this country that makes it great is that there's always an option. You can have a public option if you want. I mean, it's legal to do it. Uh, but you don't have to take away from people what they don't want to give you. You, get, you, know, that you don't have to make them forfeit a policy if they have it and they like it uh, in order to get onto yours. And it is not a valid, it is not a sufficient argument to respond by saying you will pay less in the long run. Because what they completely negate is the liberty issue. Elizabeth Warren has no time for your liberty. She despises you for wanting it. She thinks you're retarded for wanting it. You're wrong for wanting it. You're evil for wanting it. The only sin that she believes in, the only moral proposition that matters to her, is, uh, which means that there's only one way you can sin, and that is for you to deny that she has an absolute, unquestioned, God-given right, God-given right, to be your master. If you don't agree with that, you're evil. And uh, they learned absolutely nothing, which is weird because of where she's lived. Uh, the Boston Tea Party, everyone learns about it in grade school. Uh, you know, we don't want this tea, blah, 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 taxation representation, blah, blah, blah. What seems to get left out of, of the uh, discussion about this is, or not pointed out sufficiently well to stick with people, is that the taxed tea, if the colonists had let it come in, would have been cheaper for them than the tea they would, other, than the tea they would get uh, by, by refusing it. It did not matter to them that they would have to pay more for their tea. They said, we don't care if we have to pay more for our tea. This is not about the cost of the tea. It is not about how much of a tax it is. It is not about an economic issue at all. It is about the invalidity of you telling us that you will impose this upon us no matter what, that it is not valid for us to decide for ourselves whether we want to pay more or less. It's denying us the option to make this decision. Lord North, the prime minister of the day, was you know it warned very prominently by a former uh, chancellor of the exchequer, you cannot do this. The colonists will not accept this. They will not tolerate. You are building, you are creating a needless controversy that's going to you know shoot yourself in the foot for no benefit at all because they will not accept this tax. They will not let you land the T there, and it, you will have an uprising. And Lord North says no. They will be brought to heel. You may have uh, heard about the so-called, what we call the intolerable acts, the coercive, the coercive acts as they call it. Uh, this is all a response to, this is all Lord North's delusion when he, Elizabeth, warned the issue of saying that it doesn't matter 
what they want. I'm going to do this for them for their own good. They're too stupid to know. I have an absolute right to make this decision for them, and it is not valid for them to disagree. That did not work out well. They lost the colonies. We whipped them in, in a very long war. Uh, so the Boston Tea Party people know about, but the other, it's like 3,000 tons or something of tea that were sent here. And they were sent not just to Boston, but they were sent to all, you know, all, down, all down the coast. And in everywhere that they were sent, through hook or through crook, you know, sometimes by force, sometimes just by raucous protesting, they forced the relevant uh, government officials, the consignees, the people who had the contracts or the commissions to do this, out of their jobs, forced them to resign, you know, railroaded them out of town, and uh, you know, blockaded the ships and forced the captains to turn around and sail back to England or wherever, and take the tea with them. The, the colonists simply would not accept it, even though it would have been economically advantageous to them to accept it. And the reason of it, it, it's very simple. It's just, it was the principle of the thing, that you do not get to say to us, American, it is not a proper decision for you to make what what interests, what how you rate the interests in your life. You are stupid for thinking that you want uh, to make the decision about how much uh, you, about what the right uh, proportion of uh, deductible is, how you negotiate with your employer or through your union for this, or whether you want to get on this exchange or that exchange. These are not valid decisions for you. It, 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 that's just the modern day equivalent of Lord North saying, uh, let them eat cake, and I will tell them how much cake they can get, what kind of cake they like, how much they'll pay for the cake, and uh, and they will love me for it. And it didn't work out well for him. Uh, Warren seems to think that it will work out better, and this is why uh, those, those are all the substantive points I want to talk about. And this is why even Chris Saliza, or Saliza, how you say his name, he's he's like he has like a terminally acute case of Trump derangement syndrome. But uh, even he has had to write an article uh, conceding that the winner of the Democrat debate so far has been Donald Trump. It has not been. He's mentioned a couple of Democrats who've done well, but the the bottom line winner here is Donald Trump. He has gotten them to say we want to decriminalize uh, crossing the border. So that's, that's open borders right there. It is not going to be, it is, the response that we'll have a civil imposition is not going to be a response to that. Uh, it, so there's that. Uh, we, want, uh, we want to actually make it illegal for you to have uh, private health insurance. Not simply that we're going to offer a public option, but we're going to make it statute, we're going to make you a criminal for having private insurance. It, it will be a crime to get, to get uh, your own insurance. You must uh, you must get the government plan. Now, some of the more reasonable socialists said, like Kamala Harris, <laughs> she looks very much more reasonable than Warren or Sanders, and she says something like, uh, I will give the American people a choice, because I understand that it's important to the American people. They can have public Medicare or private Medicare. I'm like, <laughs> Thank you. You, know, that's, uh, you can have a black phone or a black phone. What color phone do you want? Actually, you know, it will let you have any color phone you want as long as it's black. For those of you who don't get the reference, that used to be how the UK had phones. All their phones were black because the government made the phones and the government decided that everyone will have black phones and you could not have a phone that was not black. It was, it was unlawful. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was, you know, when they, people, they'd come to America and they'd go, holy shit, they have phones in, in red and white and blue, for some strange reason, green, all kinds of crazy colors. They're not all black. Oh my God. <laughs> These crazy liberty-loving freaks over here. So anyway... It, they is that if you want that was essentially the argument the discussion you'd have with the government representative who would give you your phone uh, yes pick any color you want so long as it rhymes with black okay that's Elizabeth Warren I'm sorry that's uh, Kamala Harris you can have any Medicare plan you want the public or the private one but it must be Medicare it can't be anything else so anyway that's some of the more reasonable ones and uh, you know CNN uh, the news organizations do not generally give Trump favorable uh, coverage but they've all and you know, one way or another, had to concede that he's he's the one who's winning these these debates right now, and, and he's not even there. He doesn't have to talk about these people at all. He hasn't had to spend a single dollar in a, in campaigning. He's just they just hand him everything that he wants, and it's interesting to give you an idea of how crazy the media is. This is more on the Mueller report, but uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more. There was an MSNBC discussion about the upcoming, the then upcoming Mueller hearings, and the retard they had on to pontificate, the pundit they had on to lecture the the country about to prognosticate about what would happen, uh, would say things like, "You you know, 
Fox News isn't even covering the Mueller issue. And the, the anchors push back to that. The anchors, hmm, this sounds interesting. You're saying that Fox News does not cover, cover the Mueller issue? Hmm. Her response was, oh, really? Completely, they, they read teleprompters, and if you, ha if you get them off of their script, they don't do anything. It's like when a, a Wolf Blitzer was on Jeopardy. And, you know, just, congratulations, you won a negative million dollars. Get the fuck out of here, you idiot. He, he's like a moron. You, if he doesn't have the script written for him in front of him, he doesn't know anything. These, these are not smart people. But anyway, the guy goes on to talk about how uh, the only person on, you know, you know, who's going to be in that hearing who will have read the report is going to be Bob Mueller. He's going to give them chapter and verse whenever these Republicans try something on him. And, uh, well, if you saw, if you saw the hearings, uh, you know that that's exactly the opposite. Now, as soon as he said that, I tweeted out, I was like, it is absolutely idiotic to state that. For one, most of the people on the committee he's going to appear at are lawyers. This is the most important hearing they're going to have on the most important subject uh, of political life in at least the last few years. I can assure you that the Republicans, and the Democrats probably too, have committed substantial portions of his, of his uh, report to memory. So if he says something that does not correspond exactly with what's in that report, you can rest assured that the Republicans are going to notice it, and they are going to take him to task. And boy, howdy did they. And I'll talk about that in the next video. You have a great day.